Welcome to Christian Dawah. Today we're going to be discussing the strongest argument that the Quran is from Allah. So I hope you find this interesting. Welcome along. Over the years, during my many conversations with Muslims around the world, I found that there are a number of arguments that Muslims tend to use uh, in order to demonstrate that the Qur'an has to be from Allah, that it couldn't be from Muhammad, or it couldn't be from other people, or it couldn't be from Satan. And when perusing the internet, I found this video, once again by our friend Arabic101, who just does an excellent job of describing and laying out these arguments in a very concise way. And so, in this video, what we're going to do is break down these arguments one by one, and I'm going to attempt to show that all of these arguments do not work and that, in fact, uh, the Arabic 101 does not succeed in his project of trying to demonstrate that the Qur'an is truly from Allah. So, let's begin. First, Prophet Muhammad was the one who authored the Qur'an himself. And if you do think so, then how can you explain the following problems? The first problem is the style of writing. We do know how the Prophet talked and what his style looked like. How? We do indeed have thousands of ahadith, which are the quotations and sayings of the Prophet. So we know exactly what the style of these sayings look like. And it doesn't take an expert to realize the big difference between the style of the hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the style of the Qur'an. It clearly shows two distinct styles of writing. So, Arabic 101's first point is that the writing style of the Qur'an is totally different from the writing style of the hadith. Unfortunately, he is not starting very strong here. This is not a good argument. The idea that a person would only ever write or speak in the same genre or the same register all the time is insane. And we all know this personally, that that's not true. The way we write a text to our friends is different than the way we write a professional cover letter. And that's different than the way we would write an academic paper. And these are all different scenarios or different situations that call for different types of language. And that's what we do. We shift our language, we shift our register to match the situation. And so the same would be true here. Of course, if you were trying to pass off or forge a scripture, you wouldn't write it the same way that you speak to your friends or the way that you preach or the way that you talk when you're, when you're speaking casually. You would write it in an elevated register. You would write it in a writing style that seems very, very high and very fancy, but that wouldn't be the way that you speak every day. So the fact that the ahadith, which are recording Muhammad's you know, oral interactions, his everyday interactions with people, is different than the Qur'an, proves nothing. All that shows is that Muhammad would have used a different writing style in different situations, or a different speaking style in different situations, which is something that everybody does. So this first argument does not work at all. The second problem, blaming the Prophet, peace be upon him, in the Qur'an. The Qur'an contains several blaming verses, or in Arabic, ayatul itab where the Prophet, peace be upon him, is blamed for certain actions. So, if it was the Prophet himself who wrote the Qur'an, why would he blame himself in front of his companions? It is just simply not logical. The problem here is that this is a naive perspective on how people forge things and how people lie. Um, if you want to tell a lie that's convincing, you don't just portray yourself as perfect in every way, because if you say, I am perfect, people will instantly know that you're lying because nobody is perfect. Instead, what you want to do is mix in um, vulnerabilities and mix in self-deprecating information to make yourself look human, to make yourself look vulnerable, to make yourself look normal. And that actually increases your credibility with people because people are much more likely to believe and trust someone who they can relate to. And of course, we can only relate to people that mess up because we all make mistakes. And so um, if Muhammad was trying to make himself look as good as possible in the eyes of the people around him, actually the way to do that would not have been to portray himself as perfect. It would have been to make himself look flawed. Also, it's important to note that if he even had a cursory knowledge of the biblical prophets, like some of the minor prophets, but as well as David or Moses, he would have known that all the prophets in the Bible 
uh, were flawed human beings. In fact, David and Moses both committed murder. So if he's styling himself as a prophet, it would also make sense that he would um, include information that made himself look bad because the Bible has information that makes the prophets in the Bible look bad. So there we can see two reasons that it's there's no reason at all to think that Muhammad could not or would never have included self-deprecating information in the Quran if he was the author. In fact, the fact that that information is there uh, would have made people believe him more. And so if he was truly a good liar, he would have done exactly that. The third problem is the prophecies. The Quran contains many prophecies about many events, some of which actually came true in the time of the Prophet, like the one in Surat ar rum If the Prophet wrote the Quran himself, how could he have known things that were going to happen in the future? Wouldn't it be a big gamble losing your status among your companions if he predicted that something would happen and it didn't happen? The third argument that Arabic 101 gives is that the Quran contains prophecies that Muhammad himself could not have known. However, when we look at these prophecies, at least the two that Arabic 101 gives, we see that they might not be as convincing as he's passing them off to be. So the first one he gives is from Surat Ar-Rum, which says um, the Romans have been conquered in the neighboring land, but having been conquered, they will conquer in a few years. Basically, it's a prophecy about what the Romans or the Byzantines uh, will do at that time in terms of how they will be conquering, because at the time, the, the Byzantines, the Romans, and the Persians were at war with each other. Now, uh, the problem with this prophecy is that it's very vague, it's also very weak, and there's not really a specific time frame. Uh, you can say it's a few years, but that could mean many things. This is something to the effect of a political prediction. And the problem is that that's not really a prophecy. Uh, there are a lot of things, a lot, a lot of political situations that are obvious to people that are going to happen long before they, they ever happen. If you look at some of the writings between World War I and World War II, um, people have been predicting World War II for, for many years before it finally hit. Uh, and that's because political realities are often obvious. And so the fact that Muhammad could look and see the political situation between the Romans and the Persians and and predict that the Romans and the Persians, the Romans would conquer more territory in the next few years, that does not constitute as a prophecy that is impossible for someone to know. The second prophecy that Arabic 101 brings up is from Surat al-Fatih, which says, You will surely enter the holy mosque in security, if God please, without any fear, having shared, shaved your heads and cut your hair. Now, this uh, verse, this, this entire surah actually comes from uh, the time after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah between uh, the, the, the Islamic community in Medina and the polytheists in Mecca. And this verse is basically telling the Muslims, the early Muslim community, you will be able to go into Mecca without any problems. You'll be able to go in security. Now, again, this prophecy has two problems. The first one is the one from the previous prophecy, which is that it's a political prediction. That it's actually not that difficult to look at the political landscape between the two factions and kind of see how things are playing out. The fact that they, did, they just signed a treaty is really important. That it's not difficult to look at that and see, okay, you know, very shortly people are going to be able to go in, the tensions will have, have de-escalated and it's not going to be a problem. That's not, that's not a prophecy. That's not difficult to do. People do that all the time. Political pundits do that all the time in various circumstances. That's, that's not very impressive. Uh, the second problem is that Muhammad himself has a role to play in this whole situation. As the leader of this Islamic community, as the one treating with the polytheists in Mecca, he has power in this situation. And so, you know, it's not very convincing for him to give a prophecy about a situation over which he has some control. So if these are the strongest prophecies that you can give to show that the, the Quran cannot be from Muhammad, that's pretty weak. You need to give better prophecies than that. Furthermore, Arabic 101 says, well, aside from that, Muhammad himself would never have even bothered to predict these prophecies if he had been writing the Quran because that would have been too much of a risk because if he got them wrong, that would totally invalidate his prophethood. And that's true. That would have invalidated his prophethood, but that does not mean that he had no reason to do this. Um, actually, as we can see, this would have been a very high risk, high reward proposition. And it's only really that high risk if you know, those situations are difficult to read, which they may not have been. Um, and so in that high risk, high reward situation, uh, you know, yeah, sure, he may have risked people not believing him if he failed in this prophecy, but if he succeeded, he would become 
universally recognized as a prophet of God, which is what happened. So it's kind of like saying, well, why would anyone play poker or why would anyone do any risky proposition? Because you do anything risky because there's big benefits to it. And so in this case, Muhammad definitely could have and would have um, given prophecies in order to strengthen his prophethood, even if they were risky. You can't just say that a person would never behave in this way because people do behave in this way all the time. And it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense that if you want uh, to gain a great benefit, you're going to have to take a big risk. The fourth problem is the delay of revelations. In certain incidents, the wahi or the revelation was delayed like when his own wife was falsely accused in her honor, the wahi was delayed as well, which was a very difficult time for the Prophet, peace be upon him. If he was the one making the Qur'an, wouldn't it have been more convenient for him to just come up with an answer in these situations and clear his name and his wives among his companions? Now, there's two problems with this. The first one is that this actually cuts against the Islamic claim because if the claim is that Muhammad was the one who authored the Quran, it would actually make sense that he would have sometimes needed time to craft a verse or two or a surah um, when, he, when, he, when he wanted to address a certain topic. And so actually I would say the delay of the wahi is evidence against the fact uh, that the Quran is from God because um, Muhammad looks here like Muhammad was stalling for time for lack of a better term. <clears throat> Now, the second problem is that if it were opposite, if there was never any delay in the wahi, if the revelation immediately came, if a, if a perfectly formed entire surah just came out of Muhammad's mouth the instant that something happened and that surah perfectly addressed the topic at hand, that would actually be greater proof that the Qur'an is from God, right? Because no human could write the Qur'an just on the spot with that level of poetry and sophistication just off the top of their head. So if certain situation happens and five seconds later Muhammad gives this perfect, beautiful surah, I would say that that's actually greater evidence that the Qur'an is from God because no human could do that. So I would actually say the opposite is true. I would say the delay of the wahi is evidence against the authorship of the Qur'an being from God, and it's in favor of the authorship being from Muhammad. Problem number five, the challenge. The Qur'an contains many verses that challenge anyone who doesn't believe it. The challenge was to produce anything like it. The Qur'an even challenges humans and the jinn for that. If the Prophet, a human, had made the Qur'an himself, why would he risk embarrassing himself needlessly by challenging all humans and jinn to produce something like it? We've addressed this in a previous video, but the challenge itself is arbitrary. What does it mean to have a verse like a, a, a verse in the Quran? What, what, give us the outline. We have, to, we have no way of understanding the rules of the game here. If we're going to play the game, you have to give us the rules. And there's no rules. It's just saying like... That. Well, that could mean anything. That Something like something else, can, that can be as broad or as narrow as you want it to be. And so conveniently, the challenge is one that the rules can be kind of changed depending on oh, what, what the situation calls for. So um, I think that that's the first problem, that the, the rules of the game are arbitrary here. No one really knows what we mean by write a surah like the Quran. That, that's totally unclear. The second problem with the challenge is that it totally applies to human authors. If you take any human author, you could easily say, well, you know, I challenge you to write uh, a play like William Shakespeare did. And then we go back to the previous problem, which is that it's arbitrary, that if someone writes a play like William Shakespeare, I will always be able to nitpick a point here or there and say, oh, well, that's not like William Shakespeare. He wouldn't have written it like that. That's not quite like William Shakespeare because it's not close enough. And so this is silliness, to be honest. The, the challenge is, is silliness, it's foolishness, it's not helpful, it's not, um, it's not laid out well. And so I would say this is actually evidence of human authorship, that the fact that this uh, um, foolish challenge is found in the Qur'an is evidence against the divine authorship of the Qur'an. Problem number six, the personal information of the Prophet. The Qur'an contains no personal information about the Prophet. Not his life, his children, or his wives. His name was mentioned in the entire Qur'an only four times, which is much fewer than the mention of other prophets. So if he was the one who had made the Qur'an himself, wouldn't he have given himself more credit, or at least talked about his struggles more often? So as we can see here, 
This first possibility that the Prophet came up with the Quran himself is actually illogical and full of problems and questions for which there are no answers. Conclusion, it is impossible that the Prophet could have written the Quran himself. Arabic 101 doesn't actually really make an argument here. He just says there's very little personal information about Muhammad in the Quran, less so than Moses and Jesus. And then he just says, well, wouldn't we expect um, Muhammad, if he was the author, to have included more personal information about himself, given himself more credit, or talked about his struggles more? And my response to that question is, would we? Why would we expect that? What, what is our standard for expecting that? Why should we expect that a person would include a certain amount of personal information about themselves in everything they write? Some things I'm writing about, I might include personal information about myself and other things I might not because I have a different reason for writing it. And so you have to give an argument for why we would expect a person to include personal information about themselves in this context. And that hasn't been done. And I, I'm not aware of any argument that Muslims have given as to why why we should expect that, why we should expect a personal um, information to be given in, in, a, in a book. And a good example of this is the Bible. The biblical books are, there are many books in the Bible where the author of the book actually has very little personal information in it. Namely, the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John have basically no personal information. Luke has the most, uh, John has a few hints, but Matthew and Mark especially have almost no personal information about um, their authorship or who they are in, in the books because that's not the purpose of those books. Matthew and Mark weren't writing those books to talk about themselves, they were talking about Jesus. And so this is not a problem here. The idea that a human author would always include information about himself in his book is not true at all. And so the fact that the Quran does not include much information about Muhammad in no way shows that uh, Muhammad could not have been the author of the Quran. Well, then let's look at possibility number two. The Prophet used previous books like the Bible or the Torah to write the Qur'an. And this possibility could easily be refuted because the Prophet was illiterate, which means that he could not read or write. And even if we assume that he was not illiterate, where would he have got hold of the Bible or the Torah in Arabic? Did you know that the first Arabic translation of the Bible was made in the 9th century, which is a hundred years after the death of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, then how could he have read it? Added to that, and until around the 18th century, the church was essentially hiding the Bible from common people and forbade its translation. So the Bible was not just readily available, let alone a translation thereof. This leaves us with no other conclusion than that the Prophet could not have used the previous books to write the Qur'an. This possibility is off the table. So, now that we've dealt with the first point about whether Muhammad himself wrote the Qur'an, we'll now move on to the next point about whether Muhammad used other books to write the Qur'an, namely the Bible. And Arabic 101 has several arguments against this perspective. His first argument is that Muhammad was illiterate. And so because Muhammad was illiterate, it would have been impossible for him to read the Bible and then incorporate elements of that into the Qur'an. Now, the problem here is that this totally misunderstands the argument that non-Muslims are making here. The argument that non-Muslims make is not that Muhammad one day sat down with a copy of the Bible and then copied verses from the Bible into the Qur'an. No, of course not. That's not the claim. The claim is that there were oral traditions coming from the Bible that were circulating around Arabia at this time. And these oral traditions, they came from the Bible, some of them, some of them came from the apocryphal literature, and then some of them also came from Talmudic literature. And that there was a, just a general soup of oral traditions coming from different sources that was floating around and that Muhammad heard and then incorporated them into the Quran. And so none of this requires Muhammad to have actually been able to read or write. It doesn't take reading or writing ability to hear an oral story and then retell that oral story to other people, which is what the Quran is, right? The, Muhammad did not write the Quran down. He just recited it to the Sahaba. And so 
the entire process here, whether Muhammad was able to read or write, is completely irrelevant to this entire process, and so it's completely irrelevant to this argument. The second argument is that there was no Arabic Bible at the time of Muhammad, and so he couldn't have copied the uh, Bible into the Quran. And again, when we understand that we're talking about oral traditions floating around, again, this argument makes no sense. Because these oral traditions would have been coming from the Byzantines, the Greek speakers, this would have been coming from... Um, Hebrew speakers, this would have been coming from Aramaic speakers, because there was an Aramaic Bible, this would have been coming from, there were, there were many translations of the Bible that were floating around um, the world, the Middle East at that time, and so these oral traditions would have been translated into Arabic conversationally, um, not necessarily written down though. And in fact, I would say that the fact that Muhammad did not have access to a Bible fits better or fits very well at least, with the non-Muslim argument here. I think there's a number of parts of the Qur'an where if Muhammad had had access to a Bible, that would not have been written down in the Qur'an. Namely, the parts of the, of the Qur'an where Muhammad says that the Bible has been corrupted. I think it's very clear that if you read the Bible, you can't read, especially the Gospels, you can't read the Gospels and say, well, they're from God, but have been corrupted, and that corruption involves the resurrection and crucifixion of Jesus. Because the crucifixion account is the central part of all four gospel stories, and it's the central part of the entire New Testament. So if the idea is, well, it's just been corrupted a little bit, no, that's not corruption. That would mean like the entire story has been completely rewritten from scratch. And so the, the, the Quranic perspective on the Bible certainly sounds like it's coming from somebody who has a little bit of familiar, familiarity with the oral traditions of the, of the Bible, but has not actually read it for himself. Because if he had read it for himself, he would not have been dismissing certain elements of the Bible while also holding that it was originally from God. I think he would have had to choose. Either the Bible has basically been totally made up by people and the entire story is false because the entire story is about the resurrection of Jesus, or the Bible is completely true because the entire story is about the resurrection of Jesus. You can't really have it both ways when you read the Bible. And so, actually, I would say that the fact that there was no Bible in Arabic at the time of Muhammad lends credence to the idea that Muhammad himself was the source of the Qur'an because the Qur'an is not based on the biblical text as much as it's based on the oral traditions that were being passed around at that time, both from the Bible, as well as from the Apocrypha, as well as the Talmud. The third argument that Arabic 101 brings up is that the church was hiding the Bible. Now, to be honest, I'm not exactly sure what he's referring to here. He's not very specific. Um, I could make some guesses as to what he's referring to, but I, I'm not really sure. Um, there were some elements of the church in various places that opposed translations into um, vernacular languages like English or German, um, but that wasn't universal, and that certainly did not stop people from knowing the Bible. But the point here is that even if that was true, Again, that's missing the point, because the point is that the idea is that Muhammad was taking from oral traditions that were floating around. And those oral traditions would be passed around regardless of whether people had read the Bible or not, because stories last a long time. And so even if the Bible was totally inaccessible to people for a while, um, which again has to be proven, which he doesn't do here, um, even if that were true though, that would do nothing to stop the oral traditions from circulating, which is the claim that non-Muslims are making here. Now, moving to the final possibility. Since the Prophet was able to tell prophecies and new things a human could not have known, then it must be Satan who would help him write the Qur'an. And this is indeed one of the most illogical possibilities since we, as Muslims, are taught to seek refuge from Satan before starting to recite the Qur'an. Added to that, there are numerous verses in the Qur'an declaring Satan as the mortal foe of the human. So how could it be possible that Satan helped the Prophet to write verses cursing Satan himself and declaring him as the enemy? And why would Satan tell his plan to tempt humans and expose himself like that? Therefore, it is impossible for Satan to have helped the Prophet write the Qur'an. And now that all four possibilities out there are off the table, we're left with the only possibility that it is from the one 
with unlimited omniscient knowledge that the Qur'an is from Allah. This kind of line of thinking from Arabic 101 once again betrays his lack of understanding of what the, in this case, Christian argument is against the Muslim at this point. Satan isn't stupid. He knows very well that if he came up to people and said, Hello, people. I'm Satan. Please worship me and also please go do that evil thing. But no one would actually obey him or follow him because for the most part, people want to do what is good. Instead, what Satan does is he disguises himself as an angel of light and twists the truth and twists God's word in order to deceive people into doing an evil thing. So in the case of Muhammad here, if Satan had revealed the Quran to Muhammad, what would we expect? Well, we would expect him to show up as an angel of light. We have that. And then we would expect him to actually confirm a lot of what came before, that the truth of the Bible, which Muhammad does. He does confirm that the Bible is from God. But he twists the key parts of the Bible just enough to change it from the gospel truth, right? So many things about the story of Jesus he gets right. He gets the virgin birth right. He gets that Jesus was a great man. He gets the fact that Jesus had disciples and he did miracles. But the one key element is that Jesus was God and that he showed this by dying and resurrecting. And so Satan actually, well, that's what Satan's specialty is, is he feeds people perfect lies that have just enough truth to sound plausible, but are just different enough to actually be untrue, which deceives people and causes them to go off the path. And so Satan, we have no reason to expect that Satan would actually offer, offer himself as an alternative and tell people, oh, please worship me instead. All he needs to do is to get people to not worship God. If he gets people to not worship God as he should be worshipped, then that, that, though those people are going to go to hell. Because if you don't worship God properly, if you don't worship him as he truly is, then you're worshipping a false god. And if you're worshipping a false god, you cannot go to heaven. And so the Arabic 101's argument here that if Satan had revealed the Qur'an, that the Qur'an would be anti-Satan is just totally untrue. In fact, it's the very opposite. The fact that the Qur'an takes people off of the path of Christianity, the path of the truth of the Bible, and gives them another alternative that has a lot of the same elements, but just twisted enough to be different, actually that is a hallmark of what Satan would do. So, I hope you enjoyed this response video. If I'm being perfectly honest, uh, all of these arguments by Arabic 101 are not particularly strong, um, but they are the best arguments I've heard Muslims give in favor of the Quran's divinity. If you're a Muslim, or a Christian, um, or anyone, and you have better arguments than Arabic 101 gives um, in favor of the Quran being divine, please send me an email. Um, the, my email is listed in the description below, and I, will, I would love to make an, another response video about that because um, these arguments are pretty weak. If there are some stronger ones, I would love to interact with them. You can put them in the comments section. I can't guarantee that I will see them there, but if you send me an email, I will read it. So I hope this video has been helpful for you, and I pray that the Lord blesses you and your family greatly. Thanks for watching.